Hello and welcome to our webinar this month, and it's still September, if I'm correct, and it is September, and September is a great time to talk about snow melting, sure. because whether we want it to or not, it may start snowing here in the near future. So um, I'm Scott, and this is Anatoly, and we are from Warmly Yours, and we thank you for joining us today. So we're just going to go ahead and get started because there's no reason to fiddle around. So let's go ahead and do that. And any questions that you might have during the presentation, just enter them into that white area there to the left of the screen, and we'll be glad to answer your questions as they come up. So anytime during the presentation, feel free to add them. So here's the uh, outline for today's webinar. We're going to be talking about snow melting systems. We'll talk about walkways and stairs. And then finally, on how to actually power the system, because a system is great if you have enough power to make it work. If you don't have enough power, then you're kind of stuck shoveling snow again. So that's what we want to make sure we talk about that today. So let's take a look at stairs and walkways in the winter. Now, this looks very familiar to those who live in um, areas that do get snow. And it is often one of the most dangerous areas during winter are you know, going up and down those stairs. And the problem with shoveling is, you know, when you shovel, you are going to get a lot of the snow off of there. But also, if it's a real wet snow, it gets down into the grain, into the steps. And then when it freezes, it's just a nice frozen layer. So you've removed all the snow off the top, but you still have a frozen layer below. So what we're going to do with electric heating is we're going to get rid of all that. So let's take a look at the electric snow melting systems. And Anatoly, go ahead and uh, talk to us about this. Sure. So uh, electric snow melting systems that we provide, uh, we have this in two different types. It can be electric snow melting heating cable, or it can be a mat product that pretty much has that cable embedded uh, in the mat and pre-spaced. Uh, comparing this type of product to hydronic, we can clearly say it's 99% of that energy that is consumed by electric system is all transferred into snow melting. There's absolutely no losses comparing to your traditional hydronic system that you know, we'll lose that hot water, that temperature while going to, while traveling to that stairs, for example. So the one thing to keep uh, keep in mind about hot water systems is, first of all, if they're outdoors, you have to use glycol. And glycol, if there's ever a leak, can be quite a bit of a problem. And also, as soon as water leaves the boiler, the temperature immediately starts to drop. There's no way around that. And the thing is, the water that enters the beginning of the run of the tubing is never going to be as um, it's, it's never going to be as warm at the end as it is at the beginning. The thing with electric is you don't lose any of that going from your relay to the product very, you know, not very much. There is some line loss there, but that's negligible. And the thing is the heating product at the beginning of the cable is the same temperature as at the end of the cable. There is no uh, degradation of that temperature as it works its way down the mat. So the great thing about this, it comes in mats and cables. So let's talk about the different voltages and things like that. Yeah, so we can pretty much cover a variety of different applications uh, since we have these products available in 120, 240, 208, and 277 volts. Uh, the cable product is the one specifically that is available in 208 and 277. Uh, and again, the uh, mats are 120, 240. And eventually, with each package, with, with each order that we provide for that type of a system, we would uh, deliver the customized install plan. That's where you have all your layout, how to lay down those cables. If it's maybe a larger area, maybe that's a number of different cables and mats. Uh, there's going to be the heating element, the actual product. Uh, this, is, this system will usually come with uh, some sort of control device. Either it's automatic or a timed control relay panel to switch all that load. And if it's an automatic system, of course, it will come with a sensor to properly turn the system on and off. The thing about heating cables is the closer they are together, the more watts per square foot you have. The further they are apart, the fewer watts per square foot you have. So that's why all of our mats are based on a three inch spacing, because that way you don't have to worry about tying them down or doing anything. It's much faster to install uh, the, the rolls than it is to do the cable, because the cable you actually have to physically attach it to the rebar uh, and keep the spacing um, at that at that correct distance. Um, also, it's not very thick, is it? 
Yeah, cable is, uh, and the mat itself is only quarter of an inch thick, so the product can be easily installed in for various applications. The one thing we didn't talk about is that bronze thing there in the middle. That bronze thing is a notification that that area does have electric heating cables in it. That is a requirement of the National Electric Code that you identify a driveway or a walkway or something like that that has electric heating in it. And that's what that bronze thing is in there. So it's included to make sure that you can comply with the National Electric Code. So let's talk about testing. Yeah, so testing definitely a very important part of your whole project here because eventually the system is being installed permanently in that concrete or asphalt or, or you know, or under pavers. And we want to make sure that the system is periodically tested before, during, after the installation, and generally speaking, at every major step, at every major point of your installation. And this particular tool you see on the slide is a digital mega ohmmeter, or it can also be described as just mega or insulation tester. And what it does, it sends a 500 volt signal down the line to just identify if there are any insulation damage or if there are any short in the system. This way, you know, every step of the install, that's where we know the system is all good to kind of continue with the layers, continue with the steps. So when you get the product directly off the truck, the first thing you want to do is you want to test it. You don't want to wait until you go out and, and go out to the field and get ready for the installation and on that day test it because if something happened to it between the factory and you, there, you won't know until you actually get there to install it and that's a really bad situation to be in. So when you get the box, open it up and test each one of them. Once again, you're testing it two ways, one with an ohm meter and one with a mega ohm meter. They're two different things. Sometimes a mega ohm meter has just an ohm reading function built into it and if that's the case, you can use that for that. But what it does, it's really testing. There's three wires next to each other wrapped up in a cable. And what it's doing is you're sending voltage across two of them at a time to make sure that the insulation between them is good and you're not making a connection. Sometimes those connections can't be uh, detected with an ohm meter. They can only be detected with a mega ohm meter because an ohm meter is using a 9-volt battery. A 9-volt battery sometimes isn't enough to make it jump through that insulation. But 500 volts is. So that's why, for the outdoor product, we really recommend and require that the product is tested with an ohm meter and a mega ohm meter. And if it tests bad, when you get it, give us a call and we'll get you another one out right away. There's no reason to install a product that tests bad. So the first thing we're going to look at is a walkway or multiple walkways. So let's go ahead and get started. And what do we need to do when we're doing a walkway? I think first. First of all, the kind of main point on before planning the system and everything is understand where the expansion joints will be, let's say if it's a concrete project, right? We want to make sure that we know where the, where the expansion joints are so we can plan, our design team can plan that accordingly, uh, have individual heating elements, either it's mats or cables in each section of it. So the cable never crosses the expansion joint because this is where the, the damage can be done to the cable. It, can be cut it's just two independent monolithic slabs and we never want to have that crossing across now the thing you want to keep in mind is if you have a five foot um, walkway that's five feet wide or five and a half feet wide what you can do is we have two foot wide mats and three foot wide mats that can be installed and that way you can just roll the mats out if it's a if it's a, a job that will not divide by two or by three uh, because the mats are either two feet wide or three feet wide um, then you're going to require the snowmelt cables. And um, the way we get started with this is we always ask you just to send us a diagram of your area that you want to heat because we have engineers that figure that out for you. So you've got enough to worry about about getting the people in the right place at the right time. Let us be the ones to tell you how to install it, how much you're going to need, that sort of stuff, because we do that every day. We have a lot of experience in that. So to get off the, uh, to start it right off the bat, to kind of get an idea of the amount of cable you need, is to just simply take the square footage of that area and multiply it by four. Because if the cable is spaced every three inches, that means you get four runs of cable in a foot. So you take that square foot, square footage, multiply it times four, and that's the linear footage of the cable that you're going to need to fill that space. So let's take a look at this smart plan. Yeah, definitely a great plan. That's just what we provide with every project. And I believe I saw Karen was asking the question, if we're going to show the smart plan, here's that smart plan that we provide. And of course, this is the cable project shown. Uh, we provide as much information as we can here. 
Each run is spaced three inches, uh, three inches apart, so the cable can be spaced correctly. We show the start point of the cable, that's that triangle on the top right corner. Uh, of course, we show all the electrical specification for that particular heating product, so amps and ohms and the footage of the cold lead. Uh, and of course, down below, that's where you can get that general information about maybe name of the project, the surface type, and the most uh, important information for electrician would be the breaker size. So we show the breaker sizing needed for each given project. Eventually, this is slightly smaller project, so we can just see it's one 15 amp breaker for the heater circuit and one 15 amp breaker for control. Uh, and all the way to the right, that's where we provide just a generic total information on the amperage, total information on the wattage, operating cost, which is, for example, for this system is just 19 cents an hour, and the type of the controller that is being used. So this is a great plan. And once again, we talked about uh, expansion joints. And expansion joints for us to know are very important because we never want to try to get a cable from this area into the next area next to it. So we're always going to show you the areas between the expansion joints and notice how there's never a wire going between them. And what we do here is we talk about these being isolated uh, monolithic slabs. So the walkway is here and it's its own thing. The, the sidewalk is over here and it's its own thing. And if they move independently, you don't have to worry about that wire severing as it runs from one to the other. If you've been around the block a couple times and looked at sidewalks, sidewalks over the years don't always end up being exactly straight. You'll walk down an old sidewalk and you'll see one sidewalk is up higher or one is down lower, or it's twisted, that sort of thing. Any of that kind of motion can sever the wire inside because the sever is being, I mean, the, the wire is being held in place. And the, it, when it has to go to a different section, as soon as that section moves like that, that wire just snip, it's just like it's severed. So that's why it's so important when you give us the plan is to show us where those expansion joints are. Because we are going to design the wire to stay in those individual areas, and they don't travel from one to the other. So very good point. I'm going to get rid of this magic arrow here, and let's go to the next slide. So let's take a look at what exactly is going on here. I see colors and squares. So yeah, this is our concrete walkway cross-section. And generally speaking, that's a very, very common question for you know any installer who's planning that type of work. So uh, what we're trying to show in this cross section is just kind of positioning of all of your layers step by step, starting from the very base that is a compacted gravel, so 4 to 12 inches of compacted gravel. Then we want to lay the concrete blocks or pretty much anything to Debris. support. Yeah, to even if you have junk laying around, <laughs> as long as it'll hold that up. That, yeah, that's what we often say. If you see instructions that say concrete blocks, debris, that could be broken pieces of bricks. Yep. That can also be uh, concrete guys have uh, chairs or top hats or whatever they're going to call them in that particular part of the country. Anything to prop that rebar up, right? Yeah, just the main goal here is to suspend that rebar about two to three inches upwards because that's where we want to zip tie our snow melting cable or let's just say if it's matte product as well. So we want to zip tie that, have it suspended two to three inches above that compacted gravel and then move ahead with that final uh, lay, uh, you know, final pour of concrete that it may be four to six inches. So you have about two to three inches below, two to three inches above. So our heating product sits exactly in the center of that pour. It looks like we have a question from Karen, and that is, can your system be used under exterior porcelain pavers? Porcelain pavers. Um, yeah, I mean that would be a paver job, and that's what we're not really talking about right here. We do have information I believe we've done I'm gonna ask the crew here we've got 20 or 30 people in this room have we done one before with pavers I believe we do have an installation section in our installation manual that shows you how to do pavers so thanks folks for your assistance there I, I can't remember everything I try to but mm -hmm. sometimes I just can't but if you do have specific uh, specific questions on pavers we can get you the installation manual and it shows you exactly how to do that so um, this one we're really not going to talk too much about pavers um, but we will talk about limestone caps. I don't know if that's going to get, get enough information to you, Karen, or not, but we'll give it a whirl. So let's move on to our next one. And here we can see that there's a combination of bricks and rebar. Yep. So this is uh, the preparation step, you know, preparation maybe of that first stage where the uh, rebars, like we showed in the previous cross section, they are suspended by those bricks. 
And the type of the projects being done here is the cable that was pre, kind of prepared, pre, I, want, I almost wanted to say pre-zip tight, yes. to this uh, fan sink. So uh, the system is ready for that first pour of concrete. Then this uh, fan sink is going to be unrolled where the cable is already prepared in place, pre-spaced correctly. And then later on, eventually, the second pour of concrete will be done and, you know, project will be close to its com completion. Yeah, there's uh, two different ways you can do it with, uh, with a concrete pour. And that is you can do it at one stage where you lay all this out and just pour concrete on it and it's designed to flow through and then fill up to the four inch or six inch, whatever height you're getting to. Um, that's done very common. This uh, job is a job that uh, I actually did the install on this and um, I assisted with it. I didn't do everything. But um, if you're, this was done in a two-stage pour. So the first stage, this kind of this stuff is laid in here just to see it to make sure it'll fit. And then what happens is the um, all this the cable is taken out. The concrete is spread to just to the top. I'm going to get the magic arrow out again. Just to the top of these pieces of of rebar, and that's how they know where their their distance is that's yeah. going to be propped up. Then once the concrete is poured there, they'll take these prefabricated pads and lay them on that area. Now the thing is, if you look carefully there, you can see all this cable is already attached. This cable took a lot of time to attach to that. Do not expect that you can uh, attach this wire, uh, the, the heating cable to this wire while the concrete guy is there. This all has to be done ahead of time before the concrete person to, shows up. So when they pour the first layer and you, you surface it, you then take these pre-made mats and you lay them down and then pour over them. There is no right. time for you to tie this, this stuff off. So um, a lot of zip ties went into this particular job. <clears throat> so here we can see our first layer, right? Yeah, so that's uh, pretty much just right the next step after the concrete. The first stage of concrete was poured, the fencing was unrolled, and we can pretty much see how uh, cable is uniformly zip tied, so it's still maintaining this three inch spacing because that's what is needed for delivering that 50 watt per square foot output. Uh, and generally speaking, this uh, particular image shows where the product is just uh, getting ready for that second stage of concrete pour. Now, are we ready to have some reveal go on here? Because we've got secret um, proprietary information here that only <laughs> the most educated people will notice. I'm just joking. But anyway, no, that's not, a, I, we know that's a bush. That's not the thing I'm <laughs> talking about. But I'm going to move the magic arrow here. And what is that, Anatoly, that pink thing? So that's our preparation for that expansion joint that we were talking about. So that's how we already dividing those monolithic slabs into, let's say, two pieces. So we already poured one. And there's the, looks like the second one is poured as well. And we already have this, uh, looks like a piece of styrofoam or so, is just dividing those. So we want to make sure that that's done ahead of time. And as you can see, the none of the cables are crossing that part. So that's how we achieving those two independent areas pretty much. And we know the cable is not going to be damaged by any later movement of these slats. This appears to be some sort of snake or something. What's going on here? So that's our output. That's our cold lead cable that is pretty much getting out through the uh, piping through the conduit or so uh, and will eventually travel to your junction box or relay box. In other words, getting power. So the green cable, of course, that's your heating cable. That's what always needs to be embedded. Uh, we're going to show the cross section later on where uh, we show the parts that are not visible here. But that black cold lead and the non-heated part, that's what eventually going to travel all the way to that power source. Now, what we don't see here is that this is eventually going to be placed into another conduit. And there's going to be a junction box over here. They just didn't have that part done yet. So we have the cable coming out. This will then be attached to a piece of conduit, which will run over to a junction box here, and is always protected. You'll never, if this is installed correctly, you will never see this wire again. This wire will be in conduit, buried, going over to a junction box. So that's kind of what's going on here with this drawing. So let's go on to the next slide, and ooh, look at that. It looks fantastic. It looks very nice. So go ahead and talk about this one. So uh, at this point, we can see it looks like that installation is all pretty much all done. We got that first uh, layer poured in, cable is installed, and the second layer is looks like uh, the step here is the uh, concrete people are just finishing that second layer. We can also see 
looks to be like a control joint or it can be the expansion joint, this, uh, the line that separates those. And I can tell you which one is which because what's the difference between this line and this line? Oh yeah, it's nicely visible, right. So the pinkish, uh, pinkish styrofoam there definitely shows the actual expansion joint and that's where we never want the uh, cable to go across or, or do anything of that. But the line over there, this the smaller one where the green arrow is pointing, that's your control joint, which is typically going to be maybe about half an inch or so. And what our goal is with the control joints, we just want to make sure that that control joint will not damage the cable in any way. So in other words, if the control joints are just cut about half an inch deep, we know the cable sits at least a good two to three inches down, and that's not going to cause any problems. So pretty much going across the control joints is totally fine as long as we, you know, everybody are on the same page in terms of depth and where the cable is installed. Well, the problem is some people, uh, when they do their control joints, they they cut them two or three inches deep sometimes. And we know um, we've taken these phone calls before. If your cable is two and a half inches below the surface, and if your control joint is three inches deep, that is going to be a problem. So that's where your control joint people, you want to make sure when they're coming out to do your control joints that you tell them there's electric cable in here. Do not go any deeper than an inch, an inch half inch, whatever you need to do. Do not go very deep because there's cable running under there. So that's it for walkways. Those are pretty simple. Let's talk about stairs. And you can see this is a brownstone here, and I believe this is in Chicago, where you just have snow deposit. Um, there's a couple things about this picture that are going to become self-evident to you later when we talk about them. Um, I see handrails. Right. I see um, bullnose overhangs. Okay. And, and you probably going out there, yeah, we can see that too. What does that have to do with anything? Oh, you'll see here in just a minute. So let's move on to our next slide and you'll, you'll find out the mystery behind heating stairs. The one thing that I do want to point out before we leave is I'm going to get the magic pointer out again. And let's take a look here. These are called risers. These are the parts that you can see. If you're standing out on the street or on the sidewalk, these parts are called risers. Okay. If you see straight through the risers, if you can see through them, if, if it's just simply metal pan, support metal pan, support metal pan, we can't heat those. Those can't be heated with our product. Um, those will have to be done with some sort of infrared heat from above. If you can see through the riser, if you can see daylight through there, it tells you that that's not a good match for stair heating. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the magic arrow and let's go to our next slide. And you're going to now, Anatoly, tell us why um, why the cable placement and that sort of stuff is so important. Yeah, so uh, we can start again since we're talking a lot today about the expansion joints since, of course, it's a very critical, important point of the installation. Same here with the stairs. We want to know where expansion joints are because we never want to cross them. So on the image below, you can see that their cable, uh, we show kind of the, the simulation, the section of the cable covering the kind of small section of the top landing, then stairs. But then there is expansion joint below, which maybe have some other section that needs to be the walkway or so covered, but we don't want to cross that. So same thing with stairs. Anytime you're submitting the uh, plan or sketch to us, just mark where expansion joint will be so we know where to position our heating elements. Also, uh, what we want to talk about here is the uh, talking about the uh, open uh, open stair situation. We always using the cable, and that cable will kind of transition from step to step to step. We have that cable exactly where Scott is pointing. Thank you, Scott. That's the cable that is transitioning from one step to another. And sometimes, Anatoly, just to interrupt real yeah. quickly because I'm really good at interrupting, is sometimes that cable. Uh, to maintain a, a not too tight of a bend, we'll actually come down here and go across the face of that riser and then go down to the next stair. So that can be done in two ways, either just kind of loop it here, then across right, the front right. of the riser, then down and do a run like that. So that's possible too. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, and so transitioning that cable, we always want to embed that cable still. In other words, any section of the cable that is just sitting in the open air, eventually may just overheat and fail. So 
In this situation, it's all fine. We have the cable covered. We have the cable uh, fully embedded. If that would be like an open metal pan stairs, that's where there's pretty much no way to transition the cable with uh, and you know still be embedded. So that kind of uh, gives more information about the image that we were talking uh, previously. Uh, what else we want to say on this? Uh, well, we slide. talked about the expansion joint yeah. here. So we have a picture of the expansion joint. A lot of times the expansion joint is right here, where it goes from stair to landing. Mm -hmm. um, if there's an expansion joint there, do you see a problem here? That would be a problem because we can see how that last section of the cable are almost transitioning to a cold lead or so it crossing that particular line, if that would be, if the expansion joint would be there. So, so if there's an expansion joint, this cable actually has to run here and then out conduit on this side. Right. Tell, tell us about the, um, tell us about these things. These. Oh, so, po uh, yeah, uh, rails or so. All that definitely needs to be planned ahead of time because we don't want to install, let's say, uh, or design the system that is just going all uh, all with here, the six foot or so, but then later on when it's all poured and done, uh, the installers would come and just pre-drill, you know, start working on the pole. That most likely that cable will be damaged and we definitely want to avoid that. So please plan ahead. Let us know on that plan where the uh, where the posts or any, any work with the concrete, any cutting, any drilling into the concrete will be done and we can easily plan that route the cable around it and still get you know majority of the area heated of course now you can see where the loop ends it ends much sooner here than it does there because yep. we know that there's a, a a spot there now you can have even more confidence what we call pre-sleeving that and that would be to simply um put sleeves in the concrete pour when it's being poured and that way all you do is just put the post down in the sleeves so that way you never have to worry about hitting that cable so um what we're kind of showing here, this can also be done, this type of job can be done when we are going to put limestone caps. Limestone caps are a solution that is very popular in Chicago over old concrete stairs. Old concrete stairs that are starting to crack or the, the, they're starting to get rough on the top or whatever. What happens is you can put these cables down on the top of that old concrete and then what you do is you attach them using rebar and, and ties and hold them in place and then what you do is you just don't lay the, the two-inch limestone caps on top. You actually put mortar, about an inch of mortar, that is going to go around the cable. So you're putting the mortar around the cable. And in that inch of mortar, the cable is going to rest there. And then you're going to put the limestone caps down. Now, when you're doing limestone caps, you're going to have limestone on the top. You're going to have a limestone that's usually thinner that is going to be put on this riser. And you're going to have then the next step, and it's, and it's a repeat, two inch thick, one inch thick, two inch thick, one inch thick or less, two inch, et cetera. The problem is when you are, it's just like setting a, um, setting a, a brick. When you put a brick down, you just, don't, you just don't lay it down. Okay, I'm done. You actually take the brick and you kind of move it in to set it into that mortar. Well, the problem is, and we see this all the time, when people that are putting limestone caps on these products is right here. Because what happens is they put the, 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 uh, the mortar on the riser here. That's no problem. Then they put the mortar here on this step, and then they take, the, um, they take the limestone cap, and they do this. And they try to set it down to make it nice and firm. Well, doing this and pushing down on it, if that cable is right there, you'll see that that cable will just get sheared right through. It's like a great big saw going through it. And by doing this... You're pushing it down, and you're going to saw right through that cable. So that's one thing you really have to watch out for is to not, if you're working with your, um, your people and their limestone setters and they're coming out there, you say, I'm going to need to be there when you do this because I need to show you something, and that is to make sure that they minimize this, this rocking, sawing motion because that will be very difficult. So we also talk about make sure that you, if you give us the dimensions of this, we're going to give you the right amount of cable because you're going to tell us where these spots are. You're going to tell us where these are going to be placed, how many they are per step. There's not going to be one every step usually, so we'll need to know which step is covered, which one isn't, where that expansion joint is, and it's going to be a simple drawing you need to give us. It doesn't need to be a work of art simple sketch, by any yeah. means, but let's talk about how the cable 
ends up getting placed on this because that's a pretty important thing and we're going to talk about it here in just a second. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the next screen and let's talk about how do we plan on our end to figure out how much cable goes in a step. Yeah, so uh, this is your typical, I would say, section of the application. So uh, usually threads of about 12 inches will get just four passes of cable, just like we show here on the image. So if we do some basic example with five stairs, four feet wide, eight inch riser and 12 inch depth, we would usually plan maybe for about three inch clearance on each side. Let's just say there's gonna be handrails or even like maybe the handrails will be done, you know, later, later in the mm -hmm. future. Uh, I'm saying later. <laughs> They're going to be done in the future, and uh, we just want to be safe, so no damage will be done to the system. So we're just going to uh, subtract, you know, that half a foot. So we are down to three and a half, uh, three and a half width. We're going to multiply it by four to get these four passes in. So we now getting a total of 14 feet of cable, and then we adding another four feet for that transitioning from step to. Uh, down to another, just like Scott said, and also kind of the running, loops to running allow, to allow for the loops yeah. in the top too, because that uses extra loops and just running that cable kind of diagonally, just make it a nice soft turn so the cable will not break. So we are down to eventually 18 feet of cable needed per step. Multiplying that by five steps, we're getting roughly 90 feet of cable for just the steps. Great. And of course, we all that information will be done for you. There's really no need for you to do any of that calculation as soon as we know the, uh, we have the sketch, we know those basic dimensions, that's all we need to just get you that nice, smart plan that you show on the, uh, you saw in the previous slides. So let's talk about this. Now here's where we talked about the overhang and the lip in the picture. And you said, oh, that looks normal, that looks like every other job. The thing to remember is sometimes these overhangs or lips or whatever you want to call them, some of them are required by building code. So you're going to need to check and see if your building code is going to be okay with that or if it requires that. So if it is requiring this, the object is to do what? If something like that is required, our main goal is to transfer as much heat to that lip, to that outer edge. And of course, the only way to get that down would be to position that first run of the cable where you see those four dots. Eventually, these are four runs of the cable just going uh, back and forth there. And we want to just have that first run of the cable as close as possible to that lip, to that kind of outer edge of the lip. So eventually we still want that cable to be fully embedded. So uh, you just cannot place it directly or into the lip or anything like that. But as, as close as possible will give you the biggest amount of heat transfer. And, uh, you know, that would usually take care of the problem. But of course, depending on the outdoor conditions. Now, let's say that you're in an inch of mortar. And these limestone caps are two inches thick. So if we take a look here, the heating cables are three inches apart. And usually the heat will radiate about two to three inches. So if this is a two inch cap, it should get right to that edge right. to get enough heat. Because remember, the heat just goes in a circle. Now, if you get down here, you can see where this cable is now four inches, five inches, some kind, sometimes six inches away there is no way the heat is going to radiate to that lip. That's why we try to minimize the lip there. So if, you, if you're required to have one, you need to ask what's the minimum amount that I can have because that's what you want. You don't want this overhang too much because if you take a look at this thermodynamically, you have cold air here all the way around here, whereas there is no under you're not having cold air. This is right up against the heated surface. It's not hanging out in the air like this is. This is naturally going to be much colder on this edge than this edge will be, simply because it's surrounded by cold air. Yeah. So we need to get that element as close to the front edge of that stair as possible. So um, we did we talk about every point on this one? Um, I think so. Except the open riser stairs. If you can see through here, if you can see th if you can see daylight through here, that's not a, a candidate to get heated. Yep. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. Next slide, not the second, the next slide. So there are some important words on this plan, aren't there? For sure. So this is our smart plan for stairs. So as you can see, not significantly different in terms of the information that we provide. We still provide all that amount of information that I shared on the 
uh, previous plan. Well, this but, appears to be here. This appears to be a landing, right? Yeah. So yep. this one is a landing with the stairs. And of course, we clearly want to show that, hey, here is expansion joint. So we have two separate cables. So cable number one covers the landing. Cable, no, uh, cable number one, which is kind of yellow orange uh, cable here, and the cable number two, the green cable, covers the uh, stairs. What is that so thing? The J in the circle, that would be our uh, recommended or designed here uh, location for the junction box. So these two cables, the cable number one and cable number two, uh, can travel to this junction box, and from there, electrician will just extend it and kind of bring that cable all the way to the power source. And like I said, like I said before, the expansion joint, we, we want to show that right here. So let's say the concrete uh, contractor can review the plan, confirm that that's where the, the joint will be. And we know how to move forward, kind of approve the plan and continue. We information that, uh, interesting about this plan that we also showed that the cable on the stairs is spaced actually two and a half inches apart. Potentially was done for, because of the specific dimensions of the plan, or maybe that was something that was requested by a customer for kind of that extra heat output. Or it's hollow stairway, which means it's a concrete uh, front with the with the cuts in it, and there's air underneath it. So it's kind of like a suspended concrete, right, right. not ramp, but a concrete uh, suspended stairway. The thing you keep in mind there is if you have a suspended concrete stairway, you'll see those in a lot of stoops in Chicago where there's actually a door below, the stairs go out over the door that's below and then goes down in front, and that's kind of like a hollow area there. If wherever cold air can get at it, if you're, it's hard enough to keep something melted with just the air on top, mm -hmm. but now you have cold air on top and you have cold air going in from that hollow bottom. That requires even more electricity, requires more BTUs, because now not only do you have heat loss coming out of the top, of the stairs or the top of the walkway, you now have heat loss going out the bottom because it's just open air down here. So I have a sneaking suspicion that this might have been done because this area was solid and there might be an open walkway here. A lot of times in Chicago, you will see a, a, an adjacent white sidewalk that comes here and then goes under and goes to the door that's directly under this spot. So I have a suspicion that this may be spaced at two and a half inches because we need more BTUs because we have more heat loss. So I mean, that's the kind of stuff that we look at when you're designing something. Why can't we go, uh, can we go any smaller than two and a half inch spacing? In this particular case, two and a half inch spacing for our snow melting electric heating cable, that would be the tightest spacing that we want to go. And that just provides the, the, the reason behind that is because we don't want to turn we don't want to make that two turn on the cable any any tighter than that the cable may just be damaged and uh, uh, it's just not going to bend the way you need to have it positioned in this plan so yeah, two and a half inch would be that minimum spacing you want to go with the word you want to look for if you're shopping once again we understand here that you may not be buying from us you may be just learning from us we hope you buy from us but sometimes you'll see minimum bend radius on the spec for the cable minimum bend radius is usually 10 times the diameter of the cable so our cable is 0.25 inches 10 times that is 2.5 inches okay. so that's where you get your minimum bend radius so that's where you're going to want to keep an eye out because if you uh, buy a cable that has a minimum bend radius of three inches you can't do two and a half inch spacing right. because you can't curb it that tightly so uh, a couple other things on this plan once again Total amperage is called out. It tells you how many amps are there. It tells you how many watts are there. It tells you how many controls there, uh, what type of control it is, and how many breakers you need. This is all information that we will figure out for you. Once again, you don't have to look at your stairs and go, okay, I'm going to try to figure out how many feet of cable I need. Then I'm going to try to figure out how many breakers I need. You don't need to do that. That will all be taken care of. All you need to do is you just need to get this to us. You need the dimensions. Just tell us what the dimensions are. Tell us, obviously, we have a, an area here that is not a stairway and an area here that is a stairway. So we need to know those dimensions, and once we have those, we'll go ahead and get you a plan. That's how easy it is on your end to get started with this project. So let's take a look at the cross-section of the stairs and what's, what's going on here. So great cross-section, definitely a great picture. Uh, similar to that cross-section where we just show kind of that uh, view from the top. We showed all the layers, how it's all done. A uh, similar scenario, we showed the transitioning of the cable from stair to stair. We see those uh, uh, potentially uh, preparation pre-sleeves for the uh, 
posts or any, any handrails or any work in the concrete that will be done later. Uh, we provide the f uh, snow melt cable, the rebar, or any metal frame where that cable is attached. And in the very end, you can see that and factory splice it where the cable just ends, because potentially we do have that expansion join and another monolithic flap uh, down below. So let's take a look at the foundation. Uh, the foundation is uh, just like anything. If you have an existing concrete uh, stairway and it's looking kind of cruddy, but it's still structurally intact, then you can use it as a base. However, if, if your product, I mean, if your existing concrete uh, substrate is breaking and falling apart and has cracks and it's shifted, that sort of stuff, you're going to need to start from scratch there. So what you can do, there's a couple ways. If you have an existing one that's in good shape, you can attach the cable to the top of it and put caps over it. If you have one that's falling apart, what you can do is you can do one of two things. You can pour the, um, the, the stairway, and then once it's solidified, you can then attach the cable in the same way as we see here. Or you can actually build the form, and I've seen this, this is done many times, is actually put the metal framing inside the form. Mm -hmm. So if you look down inside the form, you'll see that there's the rebar going across. It's two to, two to three inches below the surface, and they just start pouring concrete through it. And then the, the concrete fills up the form. The cables stay where they were, two to three inches below the surface. And now you've got the entire thing poured in place. So there's a couple of different ways of doing it. Pouring it first, letting it set up, and then attaching it here, like you see with fencing on the top. Or you can get it propped up inside each stair as it goes up and then pour the concrete right through. So let's take a look at this one. So this is eventually the first option where we, we'll, let's say, already have that first uh, pour of concrete done. We set up that fencing on the top. We attach it, the cable with the zip ties and prepare all that. But then, of course, we need to transition down below. The goal is, of course, to have that cable always embedded. And in this particular case, those stairs may need to be altered just a little bit or so to run the cable nice and smooth and also to have enough place for that cable to still be embedded depending on what you know obstructions you have on the side. So in this particular example, it was you know the side of that uh, uh, kind of that corner, the edge was just chiseled out, the cable nice and you know nice and gentle moved out without any sharp tight turns. And uh, you'll really need this if you're putting a limestone cap on the front right. because um, you're either going to need to make sure you have about an inch of mortar or you can do this relief here. Sometimes if you're doing a run and it, it's running across the face down to the next uh, section and coming back, what you can do is you can just take this edge off and you don't need to worry about all that because you're just gonna kind of run it across here. Remember, the, the idea is to not make a 90 degree turn in the cable because that can damage it because it's not designed to turn that quickly. So that's kind of what's going on here. So uh, anything else here? I think that we, that get us covered here. Okay. So this is an interesting project mm -hmm. and this is kind of like a retrofit of concrete it looks like. I can't really tell what was on top of here before but what's going on with this one? So yeah like you said some sort of retrofit uh, project you know uh, improvement project or so and this is where we can see that the uh, eventually the cable is installed on top of that existing first layer However, in order for, for holding the cable in place and making sure it's positioned right, or potentially the height was a big factor here, the, there's, it's hard really to see, but there are those tiny channels. In other words, that cable currently sits in those grooves, grooves in those channels and positioned nicely and uniform with the right spacing. And you can see right where Scott is pointing right now, that first run on the cable is really nice and close to the edge. So we really can provide that good melting to that edge in case there's going to be any, you know, any overhang, any lip happening there. Yeah, so this is, um, this. Uh, I'll be honest with you, this is a pretty tough installation because your measurements have to be exactly right. If you don't use these grooves, you can kind of change the spacing to make it fit. Remember, you can do down to two and a half inch spacing, but if you go beyond three, you may not get good results. We really don't say go beyond three on stairs. Uh, but if you have to scrunch it down to two and a half, two and three quarter inch spacing, that sort of stuff, you can do that. If you're cutting grooves into it, you're not going to be able to do that so easily. You'll then have to, to give up the groove that you cut, and you're going to have to cut another groove, another saw cut. So this is a very elaborate job. Um, I would say this is done out, one out of every two or 300 jobs 
Um, we just kind of wanted to show you that where there's a will, there's a way. And, um, and, and that's what this customer did. So the one thing you need to do is you just need to make sure that you are letting the people know um, when they're installing it to make sure with those limestone caps to be very careful as they install that. So let's talk about the surface material. So with the surface material, concrete is typically done with a one stage pour. I think we kind of covered some bases of it. You know, we want to have the cable in the middle of it, uh, suspend it, one pour of concrete, and you have the cable covered. There's usually two, three inches below, two, three inches of concrete above it. A uh, two-stage pour is an option if the heating cable is attached to that existing concrete. Yeah, so if we just stop right there, yeah. Anatoly, once again, remember, I'm really good at interrupting. <laughs> but if you see here, this is where this could be a fresh pour also, and could it's be. been saw cut. So you can see that you've established the concrete, and now we're going to put the cable on top of it. What I like about this one is we can now see that it's all being done at one time. Here are your forms. Okay, here's the concrete being put in, and you can see the cable here being propped up and you can see it's being covered with with yep. a concrete so this is a perfect example of a single stage pour and there's cable here the same depth just with a fresh pour of concrete and that's gone all the way through and it's just gone through because you can see this metal fencing is about you know the holes are two to three inches of uh, squares so that ca that concrete will flow right through there now what do we need to talk about if they're doing a fresh a concrete pour. I think my big thing that I want to share is really taking extra special care using any of the tools working with the concrete, any sharp tools, any heavy tools, because last thing you want to do is, you know, start working with the rakes or so, spreading the concrete and hitting that cable and, you know, maybe just compressing that enough to create some sort of short. So really, you know, all the tools need to be prepped, uh, taped, use it upside down just to uh, avoid any sharp edges, any impact on the cable. Shovels. Before the guys get the start doing the work with shovels, have them take duct tape and put it on the edge of the shovel. So when they go like this to, to move the concrete, that that guy going like this doesn't cut right into the cable. The cable is very, very resilient until you take a, a, a some sort of tool and, and smash into it. You can cut it. If you're doing it hard enough, you can actually cut right through it because those edges are very, very sharp. So we talked about how to get the cable in and what it looks like and what the spacing is and that sort of stuff. Now, the next thing we need to know is we need to know how is this thing going to turn on? Right, definitely, you know, important still part, you know, eventually installation is your number one kind of priority to make sure it's all done nice and right. And, you know, you have the system installed. Still secondary big thing is to make sure the system is controlled and turned and just running the way you plan or the way you design it. So uh, here we're going to talk a little bit about the sensor placement. And eventually, anytime we talk about sensors, we talk about automatic control. So any automatic control will need to have a sensor. That sensor will usually just detect the precipitation and the outdoor temperature. And these are your two main factors to turn the system on, turn the system off. And just, you know, in few words, the way the sensor would turn the system, it as long as the temperature usually below 38 degrees or so, any kind of uh, moisture, rain, sleet, snow on the sensor, these two factors energize the system. And on those images here on the right, we can see that red dots are your best positions, best locations for these sensors to be installed. Because the goal for the right uh, sensor placement would be to get that normal average amount of snowfall. In other words, you don't want to have the sensor maybe right under an overhang or right under the tree or next to any bushes. Or or right next to the house. Or right next the to the number, house. The yeah. number of people that install sensors right next to the house and then call us and go, my system never turns on. And that's because it's right next to your house. So uh, when, when I grew up, the house that I grew up in, we sat at an angle. It's kind of like this picture right here. And we had snow deposit the same place every time it snowed and the wind blew. If the wind didn't blow, which is like one in 20 snows, then we had a nice even coat. If the wind blew, we knew that there was a, um, it depends on how much snow we got, there was a one, two, or a three foot drift in yeah. the same spot every time. And the idea there is if you have a drifting problem and you know where the drifting problem is, the thing you want to do is you don't want to put a sensor under your, next to your house where it never snows. You want to put your sensor out where it always drifts. 
because you're going to need to make sure that that area melts. So do not make the mistake that a lot of people do and get it right next to the house because it looks better there or whatever. We don't really care at this point what it looks like. We want it to work. So the job of the homeowner and the designer is to go to someplace and go someplace where it's always going to get hit by snow, but someplace that it's not going to get vandalized by someone taking it and breaking it off or, or uh, a place where uh, somebody can uh, not get at it. So the secret is when you are putting the sensor down, especially if you're using an aerial sensor, which most of our products use an aerial sensor because you can stick it out somewhere where the snow hits it. The thing is that aerial sensor, if you put it too low, someone can come by and take it off and break it off and just, and, and there's your few hundred dollar sensor out the window. The other problem is if you take that sensor and you put it on the roof of your garage, well, if it's down here, it's too easy to get to. And if it's on top of the roof in your garage, it's too hard to get to. The only time you ever have to do any maintenance for an electric snow melting system, this is a very important point, a very big selling point, the only piece of, 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 of work that you have to do every year to maintain it is to clean the top of the sensor off. There's no boilers to check. There are no, you know, there's no valves that to inspect. There's none of that other stuff that you have to do every year with a hot water system. You simply have to clean off the top of the sensor to make sure that it will receive the snow. Because if, you, if, if no snow can get at it, then it's not going to turn the system on. What can sit on the top of the sensor, Anatoly, every single year and cause it to not get snowed on? First of all, it can be potentially some sort of prote protective cap or so. can be any nesting, uh, can be... Ding, 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 <laughs> ding, 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 ding. You know why birds love to make nests on the sensors? Not really. The sensors are heated because it has to melt the snow. Okay. So when the snow hits, it melts. Well, birds will be figuring out, wow, this is a nice, <laughs> really warm spot. I'm going to put my nest right on top of here. Well, if you have it someplace where you can get at it, you can see the nest. However, it's sitting on the top of your roof of your garage. You don't know what's up there, and you're not going to be climbing to the top of the garage every year to clean it. Yeah. So the moral of this story is, kind of long-winded moral is, we suggest that it's put in a certain place for a reason. We just don't go say, put it in the ugliest place it can be. Well, part of the reason why we say we want it to be put there is because we know that it'll get hit by snow. So we want to make sure that it's there. We want to make sure that it's not too low that it gets vandalized, and it's not too high that you can't get at it. So what a lot of people do is they'll put it on a post, and the post is just high enough that somebody that's six foot can't get at it. And the thing is, well, that seems like it's out of reach until you get a three-foot stepladder. When you get that three-foot stepladder, you can go ahead and clean it off. Now, a lot of vandals, I don't know if you've ever watched surveillance video of, of ring doorbells or whatever, I have yet to see a vandal carry around a three-foot something to stand on. I don't know on. what you're talking about. So <laughs> you, you don't often see the because this guy's, you know, I'm going to sneak up here with my three-foot ladder and try to get it. You know, they don't have that stuff. So it can be as simple as that. If you have any other questions about where you should place your sensor and why we suggest where it goes, feel free to give us a call anytime, and we shall move on to the next slide. Yeah. Let's talk about getting power to that particular area. So what's going on in this drawing? So great drawing. Show us a nice cross-section of how the cable is routed, how everything is positioned, and uh, we can start with a heating cable. That's what you saw in those previous images and drawings as uh, the green heating cable. So it's still, of course, in the concrete because we want to have that fully embedded. Then there is a hot and cold joint, or what we also call a factory splice. That's your connection between that heating cable and the cold lead that, that goes right after it. So that's the connection. It's very fragile. We make it. We want to make sure it's not being bent or damaged or, or twisted or make any turns with that. So it needs to be laid nice and flat, still embedded in concrete, still fully embedded in general because it's partially heated. That's where your heating cable still connects with that uh, cold lead. And then in other words... Uh, and then, by code, it has to be set up this way. Right, but right. We, don't, we didn't just make this up. So. Yeah, and uh, then that cold lead, another four inch, four six inches of that cold lead, we recommend still to be uh, embedded because some heat may still be traveled there. We want to make sure and that's that, a code requirement there too. Right, and we want to make sure that it's all nicely covered. We don't have any overheating happening, and only after that the cold lead can travel in the conduit, travel upwards into that junction box or whatever that next step of that cable to get the power supply. 
So uh, these are, I would say, generally the main points of how that, uh, I would call it an exit out of the concrete for your power supply needs to be done. If you ever have a snowmelt system installed and you can see the wires coming out of the, of the concrete, that was not installed correctly. The, the conduit has to be stubbed into the pore and the cable needs to be here and the hot cold joint needs to be four to six inches away from the conduit. This joint should never ever be in the conduit. That's against the National Electric Code. It can overheat and fail in that spot. So you need to really, really keep an eye out for that. When you are having your installers come out, please make sure that you mark or they mark or they know where the hot cold joint or the factory splice is located. And what will happen here, sometimes they'll take construction paint and they will uh, spray paint on it and go ahead and make sure that the when the guys are working over that they don't work and they don't stand on it. An, uh, one job that I went to, the electricians tried to bend the hot cold joint to get it to go into the tube, uh, into the conduit, and as soon as they bent it, they broke it. Because this area cannot be bent or stepped on. What a lot of people will do is they'll take uh, paint stirring rods, you know, those wooden sticks, and they'll stick it down next to here, and that way they know when they start walking on it and they see this piece of wood sticking out, they know that's where the factory splice is, and they don't want to stand there. So they can work their way back, pull that out, finish it, and then stay away from the splice. Let's talk about the controls. We talked about how the power gets there, okay? Yep. But what we need to know now is how does this whole thing work? So yeah, uh, we talked a little bit already about the sensors. So we know how the sensor work. That sensor eventually, uh, when it meets those correct conditions, it sends the signal down to that controller. And these are our main six options for the controllers. There are five fully automatic controllers and one timer control. That's where you just turn it on for 12 hours or 10 hours, uh, depending on your uh, needs and just run the system. Usually good for uh, the systems where there's always somebody at home, can turn it on manually, can turn it off when it's needed, no need for maybe automatic uh, system. So let's talk about this one right here. This one, it can be used to, if you have a, a project that requires 100 amps and you only have 50, this, pro this product right here will allow you to do 50 at a time. So it'll turn on 50, shut it off, and then turn on 50, shut it off, turn on, and just go back and forth, going back and forth like Okay, we are back. Thank you for bearing with us. And for those of you who are watching the recording, nothing happened. Everything was cool. We just decided to take a little break. So what we're going to do now is we talked about the power modulator, how it lets you do sections when you don't have enough amperage, yeah. that sort of stuff. And the one other thing is this control over here. If you're doing a very small area, the sensor and the control is all built together. Notice how there's a sensor here at the top. That sensor will tell you if you're getting a certain amount of moisture, the temperature is built in, and this is also the switch. So if you're doing, this will do 16 amps. So if you're doing a small area and you want to save some money and you want to have the control and relay and everything all built in together, this is the product that you can do for smaller type areas. So let's talk about relay panels. So relay panel, that's kind of that first and uh, potential enter entering point for that cold lead cable to eventually get power. So relay panel is uh, just panel with the contactors. That's where we have the power getting from your circuit breaker to the relay panel. And we have the cold leads entering that relay panel to receive that power. So we have three different, uh, three main sizes of the relay panel, small with just two two pole relays and uh, all the way up to a large relay panel with a six two pole relays. And when we talk about the two pole relays, what we mean by that is that, for example, if you have six 240 volt, uh, actually, yeah, six 240 volt heating products, you can connect all six of these into that one large relay panel. But if you would have 120 volt heating system, 120 volt heating product, you can connect all 12 heating products to that one large relay panel because it has six two-pole relays. So again, we can all size that for you. There's no need to do any math here. Either it's a small or large project, we can prepare all that for you. This is a 240 job right here. You can see the red and black, and this is coming from the snow melting. What, what happens is this cable right here is, is running out to a junction box, and the wires from the mats are running to that junction box, and the electrician hooks them up there. 
there's an individual run for each mat coming back. You don't have one just gigantic wire running out that all the wires are attached to. So what happens, this runs out to there, and you can see this, and the power coming in is uh, the, uh, the power from the circuit breakers is coming in here. Um, here are all your grounds tied together. And the thing is, if you see here, there's two, there's a red, I'm mean, sorry, a white and a black wire. Those run into here, and then it attaches to red and white. So the black and white is 120 volt. All of your controls are going to be sending 120 volt to these relays. These could be 240, 208, 277, whatever they are. But this always has to be 120 because that's the red and white buttons, or uh, red and white wires. That these actually turn on the relays. So that's what makes these relays click on and click off is this control voltage, and that's always 120. Okay. So let's go on to our next one, and we kind of get an overview here uh, what's going on. And here we can see our control unit. Our control unit is always receiving power. Right. So the power is always running to it. However, it's always on, on, but it's a very low draw, 10 or 15 watts. So it's not going to break the bank for it to be on all the time. If you don't keep it on all the time, it's never going to be working with the sensor to, so the sensor can say, hey, it's snowing. Right? So the control is always on. And if you look here at the breaker panel, it's always sending power to the relays. Now, the relays don't turn on until the control tells it to. Right. So these two things always have to be getting power for it to work. And these two things, like the sensor, are going to tell the control unit, hey, it's time for, uh, time for the, to, to get the product heating, right? So then the control unit sends that 120 volts, like we just said, sends 120 volts here to turn the relays on and off. And then the 277, the 240, the 208, or whatever is being fed into the actual relays clicking on and off, then is routed out to the heating product. So here we can take a quick look at the snowmelt diagram. It yep. kind of gives you an idea of what's going on here and how the controller works with this. What's that thing before we move on? Uh, that's a slab mounted temperature sensor probe. So uh, for some of the systems, for them, some of the automatic controllers, uh, we provide that type of probe, which can be installed in the actual slab, just to make sure that the temperature of the slab doesn't go any, uh, any specific temperature. You can set that dial on the controller. Uh, some states may require that by code. Asphalt jobs would be good for uh, that type of sensor, just to make the system efficient, just to make sure it's not going over some excessive uh, temperature limit. You're, you're going to want to ask your local um, code uh, specialists, or they call them authorities having jurisdiction, whether you need to worry about having the temperature controlled of your slab. If your slab needs to be controlled to a certain temperature, and once it reaches that temperature, it needs to be turned off, then the SCP-120, the premium package, is the one that you're going to need for that particular job. So that's one question you're going to want to ask before you get started. So what are some important, important things to note? So we covered a few of these, but first of all, never cut the heating element. The constant wattage snow melting electric heating cable is designed to be installed with a full length of it. It's not designed to be kind of cut to length or modifiable on site. Same thing goes with the positioning of the heating elements. We talk about that three inch spacing or two and a half inch spacing. That's the spacing you want to position the cables. We never want to, uh, you know, fold or overlap the cable over each, uh, over each other. It's just going to overheat and potentially fail or burn itself. So uh, never run the cold lead or sensor wires across the heating element. Same thing applies here. That heating element is nice and warm. And, you know, the sensor wire is not designed to receive that temperature. So just be careful. Kind of make sure it all separated uh, and no kind of crisscrossing of the cables is happening. Consistent spacing, you, sh you saw that on a few uh, images, a few examples we showed here. That's really the goal for the system to work perfectly, like maybe you see on this image right here. Probably nice, nice spacing was maintained, snow is melting just fine. Never connect the heating rolls to each other. No uh, connection like a Christmas light we need to do here because that whole large system just not going to work. We want to have each individual heating product connected to that relay panel, just like we showed in a few slides before. Dedicated circuit for each heating element. Same, same thing like we saw uh, on the relay panel image. That, uh, dedicated power for each system. And of course, no maintenance required for the system, unlike Hydron. You're not going to buy regular uh, circuit breakers for this job. <clears throat> and you're not going to buy GFI circuit breakers either. You need to make sure that you source GFEP breakers which are designed for outdoor use or ground fault protection for equipment. 
So you may see them as GFEP, you may see them as GFPE, whatever that is, but you're not looking for GFI, you're not looking for GFCI, you're looking for GFEP or GFPE circuit breakers, which are designed for snow melting applications outdoors. So what happens if the wire, we talked about the guys with the shovels, and let's say that you have an overzealous person with a shovel. What happens? So let's just say, yeah, if the cable was damaged, either it's done uh, during the installation or maybe that's something that was detected uh, after the concrete is uh, poured and, and all finished, like we see on this image here. We still have a way to get that to work, to kind of go around that issue and get it all fixed. So the tools that we uh, provide that, we, that uh, anybody can pretty much rent from us, those tools can pinpoint where that spot is, uh, kind of heat up that section of the cable, thermal gun can show us, thermal camera can show us where that spot is on that whole surface. Uh, that section of concrete will eventually need to be opened up, digged up a little bit just to get access to that cable. Cable can be just repaired, all can be completed again. Yep, so we just do a waterproof repair and then boom, you're done. So we do have tools for that. We have videos online at warmlyyours.com where you can see how the, uh, the high pot and the Variac work to locate uh, problems in the cable. So let's talk about some numbers and then we're gonna let you folks go. Uh, we just have a few more slides here to talk about. Uh, but first thing, how much power does the system use? How do you know that? Very, very easy calculation. And again, we provide all that information for you on the quotation on those smart plants, but our systems uh, use 50 watts per square foot. What we want you to do is multiply that square footage times 50 divided by 1,000, and that's your kilowatt hour used, uh, kilowatt used per hour, pretty much. So this is going to be, once again, it's on the plan. So if you get an installation plan from us, boom, you're, you don't even have to figure anything out. It's written down there. Uh, same thing with operating costs, right? Operating costs is pretty simple. You know that kilowatt hour usage, you just want to multiply that by your local hourly rate for electricity. So, you know, if it's just 12 cents, uh, multiply those two kilowatt per hour by 12 cents, you're getting about 24 cents per hour for a 40 square foot uh, driveway or 40 square feet uh, section of that needs to be snow melted. What about the cost for the system? Uh, system cost would typically be about six to twelve dollars per square foot, not including control. Uh, and the controls that we covered before would range roughly from two hundred fifty dollars to about fifteen hundred per system. One thing you want to keep in mind is if you're planning to do to redo your driveway, don't think about just the new driveway, the new asphalt, the new controls, the new heating product. Think about what it'll cost to remove your old driveway. A lot of people don't think about that when they're doing their budget, so please keep that in mind. Any questions? We'll be glad to take uh, questions right now. We didn't have any submitted, which means we might have covered a lot of the stuff. Um, we did have one question from Mike who submitted this beforehand. And Mike asked, are there any products to use for pre-existing concrete stairs or walkways? Yeah, so uh, if the situation is uh, where the concrete is all done and there is some critical quick way that snow melting needs to be added, we want to melt that snow. Uh, there's a product on the market, uh, I believe, called Heat Track, just kind of portable mats that you lay over the surface, uh, plug in, just melt the snow. Uh, that potentially going to be the workaround. Yep, and they do, a, they do a thing for stairways, too, where they actually do stairs and they interconnect with cords. So, I mean, if you've missed the boat on that, you don't feel sorry, you can either do that or you can install an infrared heater from above, which if you've ever stood in front of a hotel in the wintertime, you know you see those things glowing above you and you feel all of a sudden you feel kind of warm. You can also use those to heat stairs, too. So um, it doesn't look like we have any questions. So why don't we invite you to our next webinar? And that's called How to Get the Most Out of Your Floor Heating Thermostat. That's going to take place Thursday, October 11th. And that's at 1 p.m. Central Time. And what's our September promotion? So September promotion is free ground shipping. So uh, free ground shipping is always good. Exactly. And we do value your feedback. Um, you're going to uh, receive an email after this uh, fantastic webinar, and it's going to ask you what you thought. You think it was fantastic or didn't you? If you wanted us to talk about something else, but we didn't. Also, if there's something uh, that uh, we don't have in our webinar library, because the one thing to keep in mind is we have a webinar library on our video section in our web page, so you can go back and see previous topics. And if there's nothing there that you want to see and we haven't presented it yet, please let us know if there's something that you'd like to be presented. 
Also, if you thought that this was too long or too short or you didn't like anything about it, please let us know. Um, you can contact us, and that is by toll-free phone number, 800-875-5285. Our emails are there, and so is our web address. And you can find us on Facebook and a bunch of different sorts of uh, social media. So right now, we'd like to thank you for watching. We appreciate you coming out. So until next time, stay warm. Be radiant. See you later, everybody.